afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Eileen West. I'm a general internist in Fairfax, Virginia. I have a concierge internal medicine practice with a focus on internal medicine women's health. And I'm really excited that you're here with us today. We are doing a Facebook Live presentation for the next 45 to 60 minutes, and we're going to be talking about family health history. Um, November is Family Health History Month, and there are some holidays coming up, which are obviously a really good opportunity to get together with your family members and learn some more things about their health, which might be beneficial for you to know uh, for your own wellness. So I'm super excited to be able to introduce a dear friend of mine from our residency training many moons ago at Tulane, um, Dr. Lori Orlando. Hi, Lori. Hello, Eileen. It's so good to see you again. It's great to see you. I'm so glad that you were free and could do this with us. We're so looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Lori is a professor of medicine at Duke. Um, she is a health services researcher, and she is the director of the Precision Medicine Program in the Center for Applied Genomics and Precision Medicine at Duke. She received her MD from Tulane University in 1998, her master's in health sciences from Duke in 2004, and a master's in management of clinical information from, from Duke more recently, 2019. She completed her fellowship and specializes in decision modeling and technology assessments. Um, her research expertise is in decision modeling and implementation science as it relates to identifying and managing individuals in clinic settings who are at increased risk for specific medical conditions. So she has done lots of research and is well NIH funded in the work that she does and we're so proud of what she's doing. Um, she Right now, the, her biggest project is focusing on using technology to overcome barriers to family health history-based risk assessment and using high-quality family health histories to guide clinical care. So first off, Lori, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and um, the things that, uh, how well, first, how you got interested in this mm -hmm. and the things that you're working on now that you're the most excited about. And, what can we all learn about this and precision medicine? Well, it was kind of a circuitous route. I think all of us end up taking a chance on something and then it changes our lives and leads us down a new path. And so family history was that for me. I was doing a lot of um, Medicare type evaluations for policy coverage of, of clinical procedures. And I was approached by a genomics group who wanted to do a health services research study around um, family history as the gateway to genetics and primary care. And mm -hmm. I was completely unconvinced. This was a, a 2005. I was completely unconvinced that genetics needed to be part of primary care at that time. Um, but I thought this is, sounds interesting and it's really, you know, in the, in the clinical setting, it'll have real impact immediately as opposed to these policy decisions that I was doing, which sort of long-term impacts. And um, so I said, sure, I'll, I'll lead the study. And it was life altering. It was remarkable. So many patients loved having that information available to them. The providers loved having the information available to them. We found that it changed care in a, a lot of people. And we'll maybe talk about this a little bit later. Um, but the impact was just tremendous. Um, and that just decided for me that this was the path I needed to take is figuring out how do we do this better in primary care and how do we get the genetics piece um, down where it needs to be, which is in the general population, as opposed to wait till you get breast cancer and then do a genetic test. You know, it's, it's too late. I mean, it's not too late. It, it, obviously, it makes a difference then, but we could have done better if we, we realized that you had that risk sooner. So um, that's, that's how I got started. Yeah. It's so interesting, you know, and as somebody who's talked with people about their family health histories for 25 years now, you know, most of the time it's pretty quick process. You, you just don't have a lot of time. You kind of hit the highlights and keep going. And uh, I'm just fascinated by the fact that you can unearth so much really helpful information and it really steers us in a different path. If you find this out early enough, it's a game changer for people. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. I'd love to hear a couple examples of the kinds of things that you discovered through, you know, through your more detailed questionnaires. Sure. So um, I guess first thing I would say is that, you know, you and I, we trained in the same place and we always just did, you know, hey, coronary artery disease, any early family history of that, colon cancer, any early fish family history of that, because we knew exactly what to do with those things. And that was pretty short and easy um, to do. Uh, but beyond that, most doctors just don't have the time and they don't know what to do with the rest of that information. So why collect all of it? Because it's really complicated. Like the guidelines for determining who is at risk for Lynch syndrome, which is um, also called uh, hereditary non-polyposis uh, syndrome, is, is really almost 80 pages long because it's about 10 different cancers that you need to ask about. And it different combinations of relatives like if you have one second degree relative at age less than this but two first degree relatives at this other age then you need to worry about it so no doctor is going to be able to remember all that just for one syndrome much less for all of the different syndromes mm -hmm. um, so so having a, a systematic process where you can collect the family history and and then have a uh, I think really uh, electronic system, uh, you know, something in the EMR that will analyze it for you and tell you, okay, this means X is really important. Um, because I do this for a living, I know these guidelines really well. And so for, I mean, I've had several patients. So for example, I had um, a patient who came to see me when he was 55, he had had colon cancer at 40 and it was resected. And they said, great, you're cured. And he went on his way and there was no more discussion about it. Um, obviously now we do point of care testing on individuals who have colon cancer at an early age for the HMPCC. And so I, I called his oncologist and said, do you still have the pathology from 15 years ago? And can you rerun the uh, sample to see if he has, um, you know, lip syndrome? And they did, and he does. Um, another, another case where I had a young woman, she's 25. And she had had uterine cancer and they did a hysterectomy and same thing. They said, okay, you're, you're cured. But when I was talking to her about her family history, it was just pronounced how many people had colon cancer in her family history. Mm -hmm. So we did her genetic testing and she had, um, she had HMPCC also, mm -hmm. and she had a twin sister, an identical twin sister who had not had cancer, but clearly had the syndrome because they have the same genetics. And so we were able to get her the care that she needed also before she developed cancer, um, which, you know, again, that's kind of our goal is get them before they have cancer. Well, and with Lynch syndrome, like so many of these genetic diseases, there are multiple different risks. It's yep. not that several different kinds of cancer. So as soon as you can actually identify the syndrome, then you know you have to screen more often and more intensively and often at a younger age yes. for a variety of different problems. So right. Or it's only different screening because you don't we don't do population based screening for renal cancers. Mm -hmm. But in Lynch syndrome, they're at increased risk for renal cancer. So you have to do screening that you wouldn't normally have otherwise ever done at all. So, um, right. yeah, it's just. Yeah, it's complicated, which is why technology can be such a boon for overcoming some of these barriers. Well, that's great. Well, I know that you've prepared a few slides for us. So why don't we let you go ahead and do the bulk of your presentation and then we will be taking questions out of the chat. So if um, the viewers out there have any questions that uh, you'd like to ask, things that have come up for you about family history or about how to talk to family members about family history or about a genetic association with any types of disease, um, put them in the chat and we will answer them after the presentation. All right, just a second here. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay, so so these slides are um, sort of tools to kind of give you a broader perspective on some of the things that um, I'll talk about. But the um, you know the first thing that I I just wanted to kind of highlight is why family history is important, and we we just talked about that a little bit. Um, 
But just to give you a, a clear picture of it, it's the most important risk factor that you can have. Um, so in other words, it's about risk. It's not about diagnosing a condition. It's about understanding what the likelihood is of developing a condition in the future. And so that's really important distinction because most of the time when we go to the doctor, it's really about treating something that we already have, whereas in this case, it's about prevention. And so forecasting that risk can lead us to change the way we care for you on the prevention side. Almost everyone can benefit from this. So in the old days, we thought, hey, you know, these people with genetic syndromes or family histories that are really bad, we'll just know them when we see them and we'll figure out what to do. And, and that turns out not to be true. And we thought that they were really rare. So if we missed one, you know, that wasn't that big a deal. But it turns out that a large proportion of the population is at increased risk for some disease um, that's got a genetic component to it. And so about 80% of people who are seen in general clinic are actually going to benefit from having a family history-based risk assessment. And that's that's huge. Um, and about 25% are actually going to have some sort of hereditary um, risk for a hereditary condition for which they would need genetic testing. Uh, again, in the past, we used to think these syndromes were really rare, but in total, they're actually probably quite more pre frequent than we thought they were. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing to think about with um, the family history is that it reflects the shared environment and the shared genetics. So we live together um, as a family and if we, we eat the same kinds of foods, we live in the same kind of neighborhood, so whether it's walkable or not walkable or safe or not safe or has access to good food or not, or smoking, um, if you're living in a house with a smoker but you don't smoke, that's all of those things kind of affect your risk for diseases down the road and don't reflect her, and you know the um, the genetic component. So family history gives you both genetics and environmental risks, uh, which is unique and and provides more information than you can get from just a genetic test, but also sometimes can be a little bit confusing. Um, so for example, in cardiovascular disease, we use a Framingham risk calculator to look at the ten year likelihood that somebody will have a, a, a cardiac event like a heart attack. And that, that risk calculator includes things like your cholesterol and whether you smoke and whether you have diabetes and how old you are and your gender, but it doesn't actually include family history. When the Europeans and the Canadians did their studies and decided how cardiovascular disease should be assessed, they basically said, we're gonna take the Framingham risk calculator and whatever that says, we're gonna multiply that times two or by two and a half, depending on the country, um, if you have a first degree relative with early heart disease. So in other words, it takes a whole entire risk calculator with all of those other risk factors in it and it doubles it or more than doubles it just by having one relative with early disease. So you can see that the impact can be quite pronounced um, if you do have a, a strong family history risk. Um, so next, go to the next slides and I'm gonna talk a little bit about these, these relatedness. Uh, so when we talk about first degree and second degree relatives, we're talking about people who are um, e more, how closely related to they, are, they are to us and how much of their DNA that we share. So to give you a visual perspective of that, we have um, the slide. So, so you is that square down at the bottom on the right. And you can see that your parents, so just above, you share 50% of your DNA with each of them. So you get one strand from your mom and one strand from your dad, and together that gives you 50% um, DNA relatedness to your parents. So that means that, um, that uh, they're your closest relatives. Your brother also will have 50% shared DNA with your parents, and so, um, because of if they're an identical twin, then they're gonna have 100% DNA um, compatibility with you. But just based on normal recombination, if they're not identical twin, then they're gonna be about 50% related to you. And then your children, because they have your DNA and your spouse's DNA, um, their children are 50% DNA related to you. So those are your first degree relatives. 
the second degree relatives are the ones that are step back. So 25% shared DNA. And that would be the grandparents again, because um, they, you get, you know, one set of grandparents will contribute 50% um, and the other set will contribute the other 50%. So you got 25% relatedness to your, to each of your grandparents and then to each of your aunts and uncles. Um, and uh, if your brother has children, so nieces or nephews are also 25% um, related to you. So those are your second degree relatives. And then third degree relatives are things like great grandparents, grandchildren, um, actually grandchildren are your um, second degree also, they're gonna be 25%. And then great grandchildren, um, cousins, so as you get further out, you have less DNA that's shared and therefore there's less um, likelihood that if they had an inherited mutation that it would end up passed on to you. So that's how we describe those first and second and third degree uh, relatives. It's based on how much DNA you share. Okay, so there's also a pretty important distinction here and that's between what and in, what increased risk means. And increased risk is something that's above the general population level. So you might've heard that breast cancer, one in nine women get breast cancer. Well, that's the average across all women in the population. And that's called a population level risk for breast cancer. However, different individuals in that population can have a significantly higher risk than that. Familial means that it's higher than population, um, but it's usually, um, not 100% risk. So it's usually something like less than 50%. So somewhere between population and 50% would be familial risk. And these are things that are typically um, multifactorial. So the genetics themselves don't drive the process entirely, or there's multiple genes that are involved. And so you need to have a lot of different things line up to have the highest level risk. So um, in this case, uh, you can do risk calculators. So like we talked about the Framingham for cardiovascular disease, which include a bunch of different things. Breast cancer is another one where they have a risk calculator that looks at lifetime risk for breast cancer and includes things like whether you've ever had a breast biopsy, whether you were ever exposed to radiation on the chest wall, for example, if you had thyroid cancer and were treated um, that way or lymphoma, uh, you know, your age and things like that. Um, so those tend to be, they do um, tend to have some genetic component to them, but they have a lot of environmental risk factors associated with them. On the other hand, the hereditary risk, these are people that tend to have a significantly higher risk. So they're, we're talking about 80, 90%, sometimes 100% for a few hereditary conditions where it's a single gene usually. For example, with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, it's the BRCA genes. If you have a mutation in one of those genes that leads to an abnormal protein, then the likelihood of developing one of the conditions in that, in that syndrome is, is really, really high. So that those are single gene mutations with very high, what we call penetrance, meaning if you have the mutation, you're very likely to develop the disease. And um, so, so there are different uh, approaches to managing those. For example, with familial risk, we might change how we screen for breast cancer. We might start screening you earlier, or we might use a breast MRI in addition to mammograms. Whereas with hereditary conditions, we're looking for that genetic mutation. And then based on that genetic mutation, you know, really high risk of developing a disease, you might have different strategies for reducing your risk. For example, having a, a breast mastectomy or having your ovaries taken out, um, which is a, a whole different level of screen of prevention than just doing a, an imaging test more frequently. And then let's see, next slide. So, and this speaks a little bit to what I was talking about before, where the huge majority of the population is actually going to benefit from a, a risk assessment. And this was from a study that we did in just a, a single health system but we've replicated much of this data across multiple health systems across the US and actually internationally as well. And what, what we found in this study was that about 25% of the um, patient population actually based on the current guidelines were 
need, or in need of getting genetic testing for one of those hereditary syndromes. So that's a quarter of the general patient population. That's that's a large number of people. So, you know, that starts to bring the genetics actually into the world of the primary care doctor. And you need to start thinking about how do I find these people and how do I make sure that they can get the genetic counseling they need and the genetic testing that they need. A very, another very small percent um, met the criteria for getting a breast MRI instead of just mammogram. And those usually start at age 25 instead of at age 40 or 50 based on our population screening guidelines for mammograms. Um, chemo prevention is a medication that you can take that will reduce your risk for breast cancer. And um, although, you know, there's some some people who, a good number of people actually, who meet criteria for that, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one because the medications do have side effects and a lot of doctors are not comfortable prescribing them. So again, knowing who these people are and getting them into the right doctor to have a conversation about whether they would benefit from that medication is really important. For colon cancer screening, a large number of people meet criteria for starting their colonoscopy, starting colon cancer screening early, so before age 50, or even um, doing it more frequently. So instead of having a normal colonoscopy and repeating it in 10 years, you would repeat it in five years for the rest of their life. So again, that's a big change from the routine screening. And that's a large number of people, uh, about 18 to 20% of the population. So this was just an example from one study that to kind of show the impact that this has in, in the primary care population and how important it is to think about doing a risk assessment. Uh, and then is there one more slide or I think that's it. Yeah. So uh, I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thank you so much. That's really interesting. I mean, I, you don't really even think about how significant an impact is until you start to look at the whole picture. Exactly. Yeah, because that study was actually only done on five cancers and, and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So if you start to include things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and hereditary cardiovascular diseases and, and liver diseases and things like that, I mean, you really are talking about almost the entire population having something. Well, and there's so many things that are passed down from from one generation to the next. And there, you know, even more minor things that you might not think of as, you know, life threatening, but a lot of things having to do with hormone status and women's health are are pertinent too. Like most women will go through menopause around the same age that their mothers did. You know, those are the kinds of things that you know, we haven't even touched on any of that because, you know, it's but it's good to have that information. It's good to know. You know, yes. so great. So, knowing that our friends and family and patients are going to be gathering over the holidays, what do you recommend? Like, what's the best way to start a conversation about family history over when you're when you're with your extended family? Yeah, this is really really important, and it's actually one of the when I talk about how my research is around implementation science for family history-based risk assessments. It's really about how do we get the data that we need? Um, how do we get high quality data? And then how do we analyze that data to make sure that we're then closing the loop and changing the care that people should have? And that first part, this high quality is, is critical because if, if you ask most patients the way we do it today, they you know, you walk into the office and, the, and they sit down and, and I say, okay, tell me about your grandma, what, it, what medical problems did she have? But most people can't tell you that, much less, you know, how old they were when they had that medical problem. And that's because families don't often share that information. One, because they don't necessarily really appreciate how important it is for the entire family to know about your personal medical conditions. And, and two, because it is personal and you don't always want to share everything with, with your family, but it's, when we started to do things like provide um, educational materials to patients about what family history is, why it's important, how to talk to relatives and what to collect, we started to get profoundly more data on the family conditions um, and were able to have more accurate and better risk assessments when we did that. So it's really, really important that you do take this step to collect this family history now so that you have it and it can be 
ready to go for uh, a risk assessment um, when it's called on. And it, and it won't be used just by you. It will be used by other members of your family. It's, it's going to be important for your children and for your brother and your brother's children and, and even potentially your parents. Um, so just remember that at the better the data quality that you get, the better the risk assessment is going to be. So, so you do want to talk to your relatives and you do want to try to share this once you're done collecting it because it does take a little bit of work. But the first thing is, is how do you approach your family about wanting to know personal information about them? And some people that's really easy, you know, you have a close relationship with them and you wouldn't feel like you were prying if you asked them about their medical problems. And other people that's going to be a little bit more challenging, you not may not be quite as close with, or you might have a sort of a challenging relationship. But one good place to start is just go to your family historian. So almost everybody has a, a person who kind of knows everything about everybody in the family to go to them and, and just get the information that they have um, about the family. So you can start with that and then start to fill in the gaps. And again, because of that relatedness diagram I showed you before, you want to start with those people who are most closely related to you because their medical conditions are going to more likely have a direct impact on you than as you go further out. So talk to your siblings, talk to your uh, parents, and then go to your aunts and uncles and your um, grandparents and um, et cetera to, to get that information. But when you start just, um, you want to start that conversation with, um, you know, the, how you've learned recently that family history is so important to understand risk, not just for you, but for say, whoever, whatever relative that is, their children, um, so that, that, so that you can kind of couch the conversation as in, this is going to benefit us all. And sorry, I'm going to ask this really personal question, but, um, would you mind sharing with me what kinds of medical conditions you have? And then you want to document um, what the condition was and what age they were when they had it, because it's really important. Those guidelines change depending on how old someone was when they um, when they had the condition. So, for example, if someone has a heart attack at age 60, uh, it, it may change your risk a little bit, but not nearly as much as, say, your first degree relative had a heart attack at age 50 um, or 45 and may change you from a familial risk level to something where we're actually more worried about a genetic risk and want to get genetic testing done. So that age can be really important. Um, the other thing to think about is how do you want to approach the, um, um, the, the, uh, Sorry, just completely blanking on what I was going to say now. <laughs> uh, the medical conditions and the age of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, if, okay. If we usually start with the biggest ones first, right? So people, yeah. I mean, okay. can, cancer the is the obvious yes. one. Okay, <laughs> who's got cancer? Right. And then, but, but it's, we don't necessarily but, want to stop there. No. So that was what I was going to say. Yeah. So, so when thinking about what you ask, so there's two ways to do this. One is to say, here's a list of conditions. I want you to tell me if you have any of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and that's where people would say, tell me if you have any of these cancers and then tell me if you have any of these heart diseases. But I, I think that's actually a really bad idea. Um, the best thing to do is actually say, just tell me what you have and then write it down, regardless of whether it's on your list of things that, you know, contribute to risk right now because this field is evolving rapidly with all of this large scale studies that are available now that have genetics. When we add good family histories to those, we're going to start finding more and more people with different types of family histories for which we can now determine their risk for disease. Um, and so new, new guidelines are going to start coming out that include family history as a risk assessment. And so you don't want to have to go back and ask your relative, every you know month or so when a new guideline comes out, hey, do you have osteoporosis? Oh, wait, I, I forgot to ask you if you have aneurysms. Have you ever had an aneurysm? Just ask them for what they had from the beginning, and then you can go back and look at your document to see if, as the guidelines change, if any of those things are relevant. Um, but if you are forced to come up, come up with a list, cancer is obviously the biggest one, then cardiovascular disease. And when we talk about cardiovascular disease, 
we're not talking about, um, well, we want to know what type of, of heart problem it was. So most people, when someone has a heart, heart problem, they just say it was a heart attack. But a heart attack is a, a, a problem with the blood flow from the heart um, to the heart muscle. And you, you can also have problems with electrical conduction, which cause arrhythmias, or even structural problems where the valves aren't opening or closing properly, or the muscle is too thick and it can't fill up properly. And all of those are different and they have different causes and they have different um, uh, impacts on your, your risk assessment. So you want to ask about each of those things in enough detail to see if you can figure out, was it a blood flow problem? Was it actually a heart attack or was it an arrhythmia? Um, but, but because cardiovascular disease is so common, it is a, an important one to try to ask about and clarify then there's the obviously diabetes. Um, so a first degree relative with diabetes um, makes your increases your um, risk for diabetes by 700 percent. There's nothing else that increases your risk that much. And that's for type smoking. 2 diabetes. Maybe smoking. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, right. That, that's for type 2 diabetes. I mean, and they're, and they're type 1 diabetes the, is, is primarily genetic. And so that also um, has a, a strong um, impact on you, whether there's a, a relative with first degree uh, with a type one diabetes. And then there's new um, new understanding now about this MODI. So MODI is maturity onset diabetes of the young. And although it's named that, it's not only of the young, um, but this is actually a genetic cause for what we usually think of as type two diabetes. And again, we thought those were very rare, but now we're seeing that you know, maybe up to five to six percent of patients that are seen and and um, for type two diabetes in endocrine clinics actually have this genetic cause, and the reason that it's important is because they're treated differently. <laughs> we yeah. need, sometimes they need insulin, sometimes they actually shouldn't be treated at all. Um, so, so these are these are some of the most common ones you definitely want to ask about. But um, other things would be liver diseases. Autoimmune diseases are really important. They're um, a broad spectrum of diseases, but they have strong genetic components to them. So this is things like ulcerative colitis or hypothyroidism or um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So they, they, they span a broad spectrum of, of conditions, but they're, they're also strongly genetically driven. We've got a question uh, about what what is the role of online services for genetic analysis? So let's switch gears a little bit. And well, the other thing I wanted to add just about the family gathering about information, really, it, it's a great idea to have one person in the family who's sort of in charge of keeping track, whoever the family historian is, the one who loves to keep the photos and keep track of the dates and figure out the family tree and and uh, do the ancestry, you know, processes. And, you know, if you can keep some of those medical diagnoses in line with that um, process, I think it can really be very, very helpful to people down the road. Yeah, actually, um, it's a it's a great point. And and so thinking about how is this information going to be shared with the family, because you once it's collected, you, you do want it stored in a in a document that can be updated over time, but shared with people, because that information, if you think about today, when I ask my patients about their grandparents, most of the time they can't answer that question. And there's a number of reasons for that. For that. Like, for example, your people of European ancestry, ancestry, World War One and World War Two destroyed families. Young men by hundreds of thousands died, and so they didn't live long enough to get medical conditions. And you know, children were taken away from their families and, and brought over to the U.S. And so they lost the connection, and they don't have any information about the family members, or even if they you know survived the war. So we don't want that to happen again. And and so of course, if we don't talk about it, that information will will go away when the person um, dies. And and so to keep that from happening for the future generations, it's really important. Just keep that document alive and shared um, for the with the family. And having that one person, that family historian, to be the person who owns that is is a great way of doing it. Mm -hmm. 
before we jump to that other question, I just wanted to stay on this for another minute. Tell us what your thoughts are about, you know, not everybody has a really straightforward family tree. There, you know, adoption is common. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, with half siblings, how does that, you know, how do you want to continue to track as much information you can with half brothers and half sisters? And how important is it to hunt down a family history if you don't have one? I mean, you now it's become easier to get some of that information, but would you say that it's worth, you know, a substantial amount of effort to do it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Again, because it affects almost everybody. Um, and if you, you know, if you think about half siblings, so I told you, you know, by relatedness, your sibling is a first degree relative and they, they share 50% of their DNA with you. If they're a half sibling, then they share 25% of their DNA with you. So that makes them the equivalent of a second degree relative. That's still really important information. Um, so yes, getting their medical history is still very, very vital. Now, let's say it's a half uncle, that probably isn't gonna be as, as valuable. Um, or even the children of the half sibling might not be as valuable, but certainly half siblings um, would be really important um, because they're, they are gonna contribute a good deal to your risk. For adoptees, so this is an ongoing and really interesting question. In fact, last week I was part of a symposium at the University of Washington um, where we specifically talked about what do you do in this situation of adoptees and should they be getting routine genetic testing because they don't have information about their family. And, um, you know, that is a, a policy question that still needs to be answered, but is but is being brought up more and more frequently. Now, some of the adoption agencies are starting to require that the family history be documented when the child is given up for uh, adoption. And that's a really good step forward. But the problem with that is usually people who are putting children up for adopted, adoption are really young. And so they haven't had time to develop medical conditions and their siblings haven't had time to develop medical conditions. And so that the family history is fairly limited at that point in life. Um, but whatever you can get is, is really important. And I, I think in the end, um, you know, I have a lot of patients who are adopted and do know some of their family history information. And I think that sometimes reaching out to find out about the biological parents and seeing if you can gather that family history, if it's not too painful, is a really valuable thing to do. Um, and if you're not able to, then I think genetic testing is going to become more and more an option to help with that. But genetic testing by itself is often not enough. So if I get, um, for example, a, a genetic test um, for breast cancer would include a gene called POLB2. And POP2 has about a 40% a increased risk of breast cancer associated with it. So it's not quite at the hereditary level, but it's really strong. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is if you have no family history, no first degree relatives with breast cancer, and you have a POP2 genetic variation that's pathogenic, your risk is about 33% for developing breast cancer. If you have two first degree relatives with breast cancer, your risk is double that at 66%. That's enormous. And so you can see how family history still contextualizes the meaning of a genetic test result. And so it's not obsolete in the, in the setting of a genetic test. But again, if you can't get the family history, then a genetic test can help you at least get a better understanding of what your hereditary risk would be. Right. Well, and the genetic testing is becoming so much more widely available now. You know, this is, uh, it's, uh, I think many, many people are curious about what's going on and whether you're screening for specific diseases or actually doing your entire genome now, this is gonna be, it's already available to, to people if they want it. Um, I know there are a lot of things that are really best served in a research setting um, because the big question, of course, with genetics is, okay, we have the information now, what do we do with it? Um, and, uh, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about, you know, what, what role does genetics play in this whole evaluation, you know, to, to help to predict future risk? Yeah. So, um, so we did a, a so right now, 
family history drives whether you get a genetic test or not. It's almost mm -hmm. all family history. There is some pieces where, I, you know, other factors that like a risk calculator result might help um, drive you towards genetic testing. But 99% of genetic testing is based entirely on your family history. Um, and the, re the reason is a little bit convoluted, um, but it's basically that that's how they determined, that's how they find, find these genes. So they take people with really bad family histories and they do sequencing on them and they go, oh, look, a lot of them have a mutation in this gene. That gene must be you know, partially contributing to that risk. Mm -hmm. So then they'll do more research and find out whether it does or doesn't. But what's important there is that it's the family history that they use to select the patients to find the genes. And then when they come up with the guidelines for who should get that gene tested, they say, oh, it should be a family history that looks like this. And, um, and that's a little bit biased because now that they're doing more sort of broad studies of, on unselected people, they're finding that there are people who have BRCA one or two mutations that are pathogenic that don't have a family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer or pancreatic cancer or melanoma um, or, or, or prostate cancer. So those are all of this, the uh, cancers that are associated with that syndrome. And, and the question is, why is that? So um, do that, does that mean that those people have this mutation, but it doesn't, it, do, it isn't going to increase their risk? Or does it mean that um, there's something going on that the family history is able to, to um, show you that we can't see yet in the genetic testing, for example? Is there another gene that's protective that they have that we don't know about? Or is there something in the environment that's protective that we don't know about? So I think, um, you know, having that family history drive the genetic test right now is 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 important, but I think it's going to evolve rapidly um, over time, kind of who should get genetic testing and who shouldn't. But the genetic testing itself, so online services are, um, there's, there's a variety of tests that you can get. And it's really important to know which one they might be offering because it really changes how you think about it. So there's genotyping, which is, we know this gene is associated with breast cancer and we know these specific mutations are associated with developing breast cancer within that gene. And, and in a genotyping panel, they'll say, I'm gonna test for these 10 mutations. And that's the only information you're gonna get those 10 mutations. It won't tell you anything about any of the other mutations that you have in that gene. And there might be hundreds that are associated with an increased risk for breast cancer, but they tested for 10. And then you get that test back and it says, oh, you don't have, you don't have a pathogenic mutation in that, in that gene. You're fine. That's not true. <laughs> and there's nothing that that test will be able to do to tell you about that, that risk for those other things. Um, so you really have to understand like what exactly is it looking at? and whether it's something that you can um, reanalyze. So in this case, a genotype is a genotype you do it once and then it just tells you what it tells you. Mm -hmm. um, if they do find something, then it's very likely that there is something there um, and you would need more evaluation. But if they don't find something, it doesn't mean that you don't have the risk. Sequencing on the other hand, looks at every single base pair in the gene and then it will compare that to you know, what's been reported as a known to be associated with, with breast cancer. And as we learn new things about what mutations are, are pathogenic, so this is an evolving field. We are, we, every day we learn about new mutations and add them to the list. And so over time, if you had a genetic test uh, that was a sequence test that was done 10 years ago, um, today, that would be irrelevant. But if it's a sequence test, we can actually reanalyze those base pairs and say, hey, uh, look, they have this mutation they, we didn't know about 10 years ago, but now we know that that's pathogenic. And so you do have a pathogenic mutation and now we can initiate um, a different kind of care. Um, so you wanna know whether it's the sequencing test or a genotyping test so you can better understand it's interpret, you know, how to interpret a negative test result and what, um, what you can do in the future with that test result. Also, um, the quality of the test. So, so online companies are often not regulated. And so they are not, um, they don't always have the most accurate tests and they don't get, um, 
evaluated to make sure that they're maintaining the quality of the instrument that's running the test, et cetera, in the same way that a clinical lab is. So there are some risks to going with online testing, although most of the big ones actually do a, a good job. And for example, a 23andMe is actually regulated by the FDA and they submitted to that. So you can be fairly certain that their tests are accurate um, and they're doing it the right way. But again, they're doing genotyping. So it is a limited test in terms of what information it'll tell you if it's negative. Uh, some companies like Invite and um, Vite Color Genomics uh, also where they do direct to consumer marketing, um, sometimes they're doing it through, say, an employer. They're saying, hey, well, we'll do this test for all of your employees who want it. Um, those companies are doing sequencing and they do have CLIA labs, so they're regulated by the FDA. And, and so you can be more comfortable that those, those tests are going to give you more meaningful information. And then the next thing is obviously when you get those test results, how do you know what they mean and who do you talk to? You can't just take this test result to your primary care doctor and ask them to tell you what it means because they don't know. <laughs> um, and that's challenging. So getting access to genetic counseling services um, is really, really critical at right now at least to really understand what the meaning of that test is or somebody like me who specializes in it, um, which there just aren't a lot of right now. Yeah, and I, I think often it starts with the family history and then, um, you know, if you can get the detailed family history and then you say, okay, there's some red flags here, we really might want to consider whether genetic testing is an option. And some primary care physicians are comfortable ordering genetic testing. I would say that the majority are less comfortable with that. Well, it's getting, it's getting easier to do and also the cost is coming down, so we're seeing more of it. But you know, finding somebody who can really help out and really answer your patient's questions is important. I, having run a few tests, I, I, um, you know, we see variant of unknown significance mm -hmm. all the time. And so yeah. that's sort of a maybe. <laughs> and, so it's not even a, it's not even a maybe. It's a, we have no clue. I mean, so yeah. that, I mean, that is one of the problems with the BUS when they, when they put it on the spectrum, they put it between benign and pathogenic and they stick it in the middle and say this is a VUS and people just interpret that as oh it could be pathogenic we just don't know yet it's not true we just don't know anything we don't know enough to say one it's leaning in either direction um, right. so it's just an it's just a no, you know no idea at this point TBD um, <laughs> yeah right exactly that's, that's what it should be called TBD I think that would help a lot um, yeah. But, you know, again, some of these companies do offer genetic counseling services as part of the cost of the test or even as an extra, extra price. And it's totally a worth lot it of them to do. do that. Yes. Yeah. I would agree. I think being able to sit down and talk through, talk through, first of all, the indications for the test in the first place, and then making sure that the right tests are being ordered because there are literally hundreds of options. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you yeah. like occasionally I will try to order a, um, a genetic test directly. I mean, we have a red cherry cancer clinic and they um, prefer to see their patients and do the counseling and then order the right test. But occasionally I'll just order it directly myself because they get really backed up. And, you know, you go on there and it's like, oh, there's this breast cancer panel with a hundred genes on it. And here's one with 30 genes on it. And here's one, you know, and it, you just don't know, like, what am I supposed to be? More must be better. Right. And that's not necessarily true. Um, they just don't make it easy. So, yeah, and it's changing all the time. Like they're constantly changing their panels, right. adding new things. I yeah. think genetic counselors are amazing individuals. Yeah. They yeah. really I, are. I have two that work with me on all of my projects. Believe me, <laughs> they're indispensable. Yes, and and um, you know your primary care physician can refer you to a genetic counselor very easily. Um, they just need have to know the, the network and, and know who yeah. to contact. And often it, there isn't a necessarily a big cost associated with that. So that's a good thing. And then, of course, the question always comes up. Well, OK, I, I got one of the I did the test. You know, my mom had breast cancer. I've done the test. I have this variant of unknown significance. When do I do this again? And do, do you have any sort of standard advice that you 
but I always, there a window of time. I know that there were a lot of additional breast cancer um, sequencing processes that started about nine or 10 years ago. Um, yeah. So if any testing you had was prior to that, and you're still, you know, you, you got the test in the first place because of family history, it might be worthwhile to think about repeating that. But well, again, you don't have to. So most of these companies who do sequencing, so if you if get a sequencing, sequence, you can ask them to, you, they just reanalyze the sequence. And, and a lot of them now are saying, we will reanalyze the sequence for you at no charge every so often. And so then they notify you if there's been a change um, in the classification of something. Um, when they reanalyze it um, or you can in some cases you can just say hey you know reanalyze it and it really just depends on like what's the rate of change in our knowledge about variants and right now it's just rapid <laughs> so you know every couple of years it would be worth it um, if it's a genotype then you have to actually repeat uh, the test and make sure that the genotype you're getting includes the new stuff um, a genotype won't give you a VUS because the genotype is only testing for very specific mutations that they know are pathogenic. Um, so again, it really matters what the test is. Um, and, and family history actually is something that should be updated. Probably there was a study about 10 years ago that suggested that every three years there was a family event that was meaningful enough that it could change your risk. Um, and that so family history ought to be updated uh, about that often. Every three years. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I hadn't heard that. That's great. Um, and with some of the genetic testing, just to conclude on that, they're also, some of these companies will also go ahead and test family members. Um, yeah, for do cascade screening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but right, that, so that's if, more targeted testing usually, right? Right. So if you have, if they find a pathogenic variant, now we know this mutate this gene this variant at this base pair right um so then what you get you say okay well this is this is important right i fit i'm 50 percent likely that i pass this on to my children and that my parents have one of my parents has it and so on so so then you need to start getting your relatives tested but they will do for 50 bucks almost any company out there will just do that one variant so they'll take a sample and say i'm just going to check to see if you have that and then you'll know whether you inherited that from your um, from your family or not. So uh, we have a question in the chat about uh, trying to access some of these services. What do you do if you don't even have a primary care doctor? Yeah. Well, that's a good that's a good question. I mean, <laughs> some of these places can self refer. You go online and sign up for an appointment. I I think it typically works better if you have somebody who hears the story initially and can can you know help you decide whether the test is really worth doing so yeah there's um genome medical and um one there's a couple others but genome medical was one of the first one is actually a company that is just a bunch of um genetic counselors that will do direct to consumer counseling and testing. And so if you really wanted to know and you didn't have a, a doctor involved, you could contact you know one of those companies and say, I need genetic counseling and they will gather the family history information and all of the other environmental stuff. And then they'll tell you whether you should get genetic testing or not. And if you should, and you want to, then they'll do it for you and they'll interpret it for you. So that is a pathway. Um, it's always better if your doctor is involved <laughs> always but but if the doctor's not comfortable or if you don't have one that is a option for you and a lot of larger places where you live sent bigger bigger um communities will have these people in place already but there are also services around the country that are able to do these visits virtually and to yep. make those connections so um yep. You know, I know there's a, a good one out of Northwestern. I'm sure there are tons of them that you could could look and, and explore and figure out who to ask. So. Yeah, it's just that it's a you know, it's a relatively scarce resource in a in a world where genomics and genetic testing is exploding. exploding. So um, <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to find them. Um, it was always hard to find them. And now it's it's even harder. But um, but they they're are there any online like what do you think oh yeah because some of them are online, they're, they're online. Like, the company your own information and it'll help you decide hey go talk to you need to ask someone else about this uh, 
Well, that's what my tool does. Uh, but, I know. But that, we're all about the computer. That, that's what, I, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, we do that. Um, there's no good. There's some that are out there that are very specific on a specific condition. So for cancer IQ, you can go um, code there and they, you can get a cancer risk assessment for like colon and breast and, and maybe a couple others. Um, Invitae has one for some cancers. So there are some tools out there where you can get very specific. And, and you know, and you think about it, these are companies that do genetic testing. So they're trying to help drive people to the genetic test if they if they need it. Um, so it's a, it's a nice service, but it is um, it's very specific to what the company is and what kind of yeah, testing they do. Driven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, and some of these are we've been thinking about em employing one of these where you like literally these the companies will have you know you can say okay your doctor wants you to take the quiz and then you know yeah. the, the week before your appointment it's texting you and saying hey, you do you want to do the quiz now and you can do the whole thing on your cell phone. And yep. then the data goes in and then, you know, yep. you, the doctor has the information when you arrive and you can make decisions then about whether yep. the actual testing is indicated. So yep. that's neat. So Lori, is the, pro the project that you are working on at Duke is a, is a detailed family history report reporting form. And I, the last time I talked to you about it, it was still very much in the research stages mm -hmm. and is that more widely available now? How, where, how are things going with that? Well, so um, yeah, so it's it, we've expanded it dramatically. So it's a web service, and it's a it's got a graphical user interface that's good for like phones and um, tablets, and um, as well as just a regular desktop. And we've incorporated all the different um, ways that we know people think about family history and how they collect family history to make it as easy as possible. And then it runs through all the algorithms that we have encoded. So right now we have 30, 45 conditions for which we do clinical decision support based on guidelines for risk for, for 45 different diseases. Wow. And that is, um, and it's in research studies. Mm -hmm. We did license it from Duke um, and we did start a company, um, but I'm not a business person, I'm <laughs> just a yeah. doctor. <laughs> and so figuring out like how, how this will actually work, the whole point of licensing it though was so that we could make it available to people to use, but it isn't. It and isn't and will it be for the physicians who want to offer this or direct to the patients? It could be either. Either. Yeah, but we haven't, like I said, it's not out there yet because we haven't figured out how to do that. You know, it takes money oh. and the other things that I don't want to think about. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, You'd yeah. much rather just stick to getting the medical information. Yeah, that, yeah. Know, just like doing it. Solving the problem, <laughs> right? Let somebody else handle the business part. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think a lot of physicians might feel that way. I don't think you're alone. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's great. Uh, it's it's so interesting to hear because this area is evolving so quickly, and it, it's just really important as a primary care physician to stay on top of these things and to understand what's coming up um, so that we can best serve our patients. And, you know, that I, I, you know, a lot of things still boil down to, you know, everything you really need to know you learned from your grandmother or in kindergarten or whatever, but, you know, healthy habits last a lifetime. And it's really important to start them early and, and, you know, the genetic, but the genetic factors can't be ignored. I mean, they are, they are at least 50% of how our lives turn out. So it's really important to understand them the best way we can. So, so wonderful. Well, we're, our time is about up. And um, did you have any other last thoughts or comments you wanted to toss in before we finish? No, I just, you know, think about it do it, record it, and share it. That's it. <laughs> exactly. Everybody should have a family health history. It's so important down the road. And it's so helpful as people, um, you know, as you, you grow, as your kids grow, it's just very, very valuable information. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's so good to see you. We need to get together again soon. Absolutely. And thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we really appreciate your information and your expertise. And um, we'll bring you back for an update at some point. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And um, 
we look forward to uh, talking with you again soon. Take care.